Hello everyone, my name is Carrie Wolf and I'm the exhibition director at the Dairy Barn Arts Center. Today we are hosting an artist talk with three artists exhibiting in the Women of Appalachia Fine Art Exhibition, which is on view January 13th through March 19th, 2023. And we'll go ahead and let the artist introduce themselves. We'll start with Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy Hirschberger and I'm a fiber artist in South Central Pennsylvania. And I live in the Appalachian uh, Mountains, in the Allegheny Mountains, which is part of Appalachia. And um, I've been working as a fiber artist for a little over 10 years. Actually, yeah, more than 10 years, but never mind. <laughs> and uh, I, I make art quilts that look like paintings and I focus mostly on landscapes and I truly, truly en enjoy this, this kind of work. And it's an honor to be in this show at the Dairy Barn. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Susan Morgan. Hi, I am uh, consider myself a, a textile artist. Um, I live in central West Virginia, right smack in the middle of Appalachia. Um, I've been selling my fiber artwork probably, I guess, for about 20 years. Um, I've gotten, in the past five years, I've, I've moved um, into more um, pieces that express my feelings about the, our social world and our political climate. So a lot of my pieces anymore um, are expressing my examination of the world today. So the piece that's in this show, I think it is in line with that. And I'm Susan Feller. I live in the Eastern Panhandle, the Potomac Highlands of West Virginia. I uh, originally came from the northwest corner of New Jersey uh, in the Appalachians and moved here um, permanently in 2006. My fiber art career began in 1994 uh, when I learned rug hooking, I was, studied uh, fine arts and photography was my medium. But the traditional handcrafts of rug hooking, stitching, applique are really, really um, the way I identify with uh, slow processes and able to explore topics. I think it's really therapeutic to work um, without a tool that has a machine and to work at your own pace and, and process the work that you're, the topics that you're working on. And I'm, I'm just very happy to be part of Women of Appalachia and certainly at the Dairy Barn. Yeah, right. We're lucky to have all three of you in the show. Um, so now I'm going to just hand it over to you all for the talk. Um, if you need me, just let me know. I can pop back in. So it's all you. Okay. Can I go first? Um, first of all, I want to ask you both about your processes. Susan, I was, Susan Morgan, I was looking at your work up close. And so what I'm wondering is, First of all, how, uh, what am I trying to say? How do you arrive at what you're, what you're going to focus on, what you're going to do? Do you have a list? Do you keep a list? Do you say, I am going to speak about this in this piece? Or does it, is it organic? Do you just go with... I feel like doing this now. This is what I have to say right this moment. How, how do you arrive at that? I, um, I'm a big news junkie. And I also like discussions with family and friends about current events and current topics and things. I guess an issue kind of gets in my head. And I, I'm a pretty focused person. Um, once an idea gets in my head, it's hard for me to kind of let go of it and I'll think about it and, and talk to people about it and get other points of view. 
Um, and then it just, the vision of how I can express that idea comes into my head. And once that happens, I start work and I only work on one piece at a time. I never have unfinished pieces. Um, I stick with it. And while I'm working on it, like Susan Feller stated, it can be slow work sometimes. And that affords me a lot of time to really examine how I feel and see all the gray areas where I'm not so sure how I feel. Um, but that's kind of how it is. Something weighs on my mind for a while. I suddenly somehow get an image of how to express it. And then I just focus on that. That's kind of how it goes for me. So it comes up and and that's it. You're you go without the way that feels at that moment and you just dive dive right in. Wow. Yes. Susan are <laughs> Susan Feller, are you that way too? Do you mm -hmm. it, it's it organic? Is it planned? My you work, create? Um, my work currently is about social issues and human impact on nature or a particular topic. So the, the journals that are in the show and my other piece, Jane's Choice, they're specific topics on time. And I feel that it's a, as contemporary artists, it's our responsibility to document not only but the this environment that we're in and the society that we're in. So each of the, I, I did an artist residency in 2020. I stayed home <laughs> and I listened, as, as Susan said, I'm a news junkie. It's NPR on, on the radio all the time. We don't have a TV, so I'm, I'm not inundated with visuals. Um, I wrote quotes down all the time. And then I, I, I needed to do, do something because I wasn't traveling, I wasn't teaching, I wasn't at exhibits. So my my hooking um, calms me down, and I finally decided that I would create a journal of the events. So the first six months happened. I I did the first panel in July, January through June, um, and then I had to cull through the the folder of all the different quotes that I had put down, and and some of them were pretty redundant or very um, too dark. So my work always, um, I think it's my, it definitely is my therapy. And, and I think it's, it's, it's how I process um, any particular work that's happening. I hope that in 50 years, someone will be able to look at a piece of mine and, and know a little bit about my own personal story from uh, understanding it. Wow. That is... Really, so, I guess it's my turn, huh? <laughs> yeah, it is, because you're documenting the beauty around you. Thank you. I, thanks. I, um, how do I want to say this? I am not a news junkie. I try to avoid it, actually, because I find it so, and I'm whispering. Anyway, um, anyway, I, tr I try to avoid the bad news. I can't take it. I can't. And I also have done artist residencies at national parks. Mm. Um, and you want to talk about, <clears throat> no, I don't know what you, we're, we're talking about anything, but here, but, but you know what I mean? when you step inside a national park and this one in particular that, <clears throat> excuse me, the piece that's in this show is called Dark Hollow Falls. And this is at Shenandoah National Park. And there, you know, the hike to that waterfall is not very long. It's like about a mile and a half round trip, but it's worth every aching muscle and joint to get there because it's very steep. 
And, and once you get down there and you look at that, and actually the descent taking you there takes you, winds you around, and you, it's just this beautiful, crystal clear, sparkling water that's slowly descending. And then all of a sudden you're at the falls and the falls, it's more like a cascade. It steps down and then you get at the very bottom and it's just, it's just beautiful. And when you see something that like that, you can't help but be moved by the beauty that is really right in our backyard being you know part of this of Appalachia and I that's what I want to focus on and this this gets me um that's what I want to see that's what I want to experience and I need I need I need that that's my therapy yeah that's my therapy. So interpreting the national parks for me as an artist in residence is one of my biggest passions right now. And, um, and yeah, uh, depicting, creating the illusion of water with fabric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a challenge. So, uh, so anyway, yeah, that's my passion. Uh, but I do appreciate the way you are able to do that and face it and say, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I have to say. And um, yeah, anyway, so there Nancy, we have it. Nancy, could you speak to your process of creating and, and how, you know, what you are physically doing to create your pieces, how okay. they're done? Thank you. Um, well, uh, it, minor quilts, minor stitched very densely. So the process is I start with a photograph uh, that I've taken, or if I get can get permission uh, from from a photographer, artist, someone who has taken a picture that I found find particularly moving, I will you know I'll use that. But what I like to do is I, I use that as my jumping off point. I'm not copying it. Um, I'm interpreting it. And that's one of my, actually, that's one of my things. Um, if someone ever says, oh yeah, you just copied that from photo. No, 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 I didn't. Um, but, uh, so I, you know, blow it up so I can see some detail, but the, the quilt itself is much larger. So I'm scaling up, uh, a bit and I, I fuse. So as fiber artists, we know what fusing is, but to those who may not, uh, fusing uh, fabric is uh, using a type of glue that goes on the back of a piece of fabric. And it's activated by heat. So I'm fusing it directly onto the batting. And I do like to use silk batting because if it's light, it's lightweight um, and it doesn't get stiff when you quilt it. I like to quilt very densely, but the process, the process is very much like traditional applique because I'm, I'm just a fusing pieces of fabric onto directly onto the batting. And in some places it's many, many layers in others. It's just one, one layer. And the, if you see the piece behind me, the sky is all one piece. I do use paint. I use inks, I use oil paints, Shiva oil paint sticks, acrylic paints that are made for textiles, and Sukuniko inks, which are water-based inks that uh, when they're heat set, they're permanent. They're not like the other things that'll bleed and it, it, it's just, they're just tools that I use that work for me. Other people use different tools and Susan Morgan, I want to get to the, I'd like to hear about your process too, because yours is very different from mine, but I, are yours fused? Oh, by the way, one more thing. After the top is fused directly onto the batting, then I put the backing on just like traditional quilters do and stitch it with a domestic sewing machine. And, um, you know, you know, we're doing this and, uh, and then it's done. Ta-da. 
Uh, but Susan Morgan, thank you for bringing that up because I was looking at yours and I was trying to really zoom in and I was looking for your stitching and are yours quilted? They, they are. Um, I do very little fusing. Um, on some tiny pieces, I will fuse, but my process is um, I hand dye all my fabric. I don't use any commercial fabric in my work. Wow. Okay. Um, and then I take my images and I make screens out of them and screen the images on. So for instance, the drag queen was screened in several parts. I, I made a silk screen of her hair, face, um, hands, and then I do raw edge applique. I take my screened image. So I've got say the hair and the screening of the hair is done on a bigger piece of fabric. I lay that piece of fabric down with the, the hair on it. And then I stitch around it and trim away all the excess fabric. So everything is raw. That's called raw edge applique. Right. Right, right. And mine is mine is all raw edge applique. And I purposefully downplay the stitching in mine. Okay. I use a really heavyweight thread that when it's stitched looks more like a, a pencil line or a line of paint. It, it I use a small stitch length and a heavy thread so I get a heavier line. Mm -hmm that kind of fools the eye. You don't really realize it's stitching when you see it. And that's, um, and that's how seeing it in person, you might be able to realize that it's stitched, but on a, on an image on your screen, it will be harder to tell. That's real. So you have a backing as well, right? Mm -hmm. And you're putting a binding on it. Um, it is a binding. My binding is a piece of fabric that's larger than the finished piece. And I wrap the back around to the front. I'm not using a like a bias cut binding. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm wrapping the background around. I just like that it gives it a nice, neat look. Right. Um, and I usually use some kind of dyed canvas to do that, um, which gives it a, a, a stiffer ability to hang on the wall more flat um so susan what um tell us about your process in my case um i'll go to the dye pot if i really need a specific color and i have quite a bit of inventory on that so during 2020 i, I decided i would buy nothing of course i wasn't going to travel and I went into my own inventory. My stash is pretty interesting. So I use off the bolt wool fabric um, or found clothing that has been taken apart. There's even a piece of um, yoga pants. I needed more black. <laughs> and I found a piece of clothing that could be cut up. Um, so that, that refers to the traditions of rug hooking being similar to quilting you know, using whatever fabric was available. But most of my um, materials are new fabric that I have dyed. So everything, um, I think that that's the fun part of finally learning how to communicate and, and create your own color palette because it's a medium that I really enjoy dyeing in the dye pots. So, and then everything is um, I, I use strips of fabric, so they're cut at different widths that I need. Sometimes I use sari silk, um, yarns, the threads that are um, in the COVID that are sticking out. They came from uh, a West Virginian, Wendy Clark. They are leftover thrums from her weaving. And I was so excited to get that bag. So I sort them out and just use little pieces here and there. Um, so that that adds the texture and, and other um, Wool is so flat, it absorbs light. So it's really nice to put silks and, and other materials in, including plastic or um, Starbucks coffee bags if necessary. Susan Feller, you mentioned you did an artist residency in 2020. 
Where was that? Was that at a, at a national park? No, it was right home. I couldn't go anywhere. Oh, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I played with my mind and said, well, my calendar screwed up. What am I doing? Oh, I'm doing an artist residency. And before the journal pieces, um, I, I'm, I totally agree with you. I would rather be out in nature. And I, to this day, think one, one year I'm going to hike the Appalachian Trail. And I've admitted that I probably won't. Um, but I hooked it. So I... Wow. I I hooked the entire trail. There's a map that's a vertical map of the trail. Um, and I plotted it out on on um, on really long linen um, with all the blazes. And then the, the higher ground and the lower areas, I, I just changed up the values. And that again was all out of my materials. So I sorted my materials in that case. I started in Georgia so in spring in April and it was a very spring palette. And then I moved up through the trail into the Shenandoah oh. Valleys and the Northern or the, the mountains were still, you know, beautiful spring and the valleys were starting to get warmer. So I changed the colors into early summer. And then as it went on past my house in New Jersey, it was uh, midsummer, so much warmer colors. And then as I got up to New England and the Katahdin Mountain, it was winter area or very late fall. And I've traveled all along there, um, you know, visiting and, and such. So I had some friends and I posted it every day and, and friends who lived near the trail would tell me about, um, you know, where color and I put a little piece in for them. So that was a really good distraction for me. Um, so it really is the beauty of where we are all living. Um, that's so, so important. Um, I, I, I just love going back to that. And it was, it was really, really fun to do that and to distract myself. Wow. Um, can I ask you another question about, uh, continuing about your process? Um, I'm not that familiar with your type of textile fiber art. Are you creating this on a um, uh, on canvas? How how what what holds that together? How do you put that together? Yeah, so the backing is a loose weave and uh, linen. I like using linen because you can poke your hook, which is basically a modified crochet hook. In my okay. case, I like I have a shaft that it's a, a brass shack shaft that's tapered. So as you poke it into the hole in your weave of your linen to get the strip of fabric that's underneath and pull it up, you're opening up that weave at that particular time. And you can pull up a wider strip than what the typical uh, hole looks like. Then you pull it up and all the other weave of the linen tightens up as you progress to fill it up. So you go down, you're using a progressive strip um, and it's a, about five minutes to learn how you raise the tail up and, and there are no, um, there are, you're not cutting every loop or anything at all. And what happens is you pull your loop up and roll it back because you're going to go back in and get your next one. And if you pull forward, you're going to pull out that first loop. So you want to keep rolling it back and then adjust the height as to what you want it to look like after you've made two loops. So you get fussy at that point. And, and it becomes a little bit of a machine as you uh, progress over the years. Okay, and then is it mounted? Do you mount it on something when it's complete? Well, it's called rug hooking because you can walk on these. The, we're making rugs, um, but just like your quilts that are art, quilts instead of bed quilts I'll put a sleeve most typically on the long runners and they can hang definitely okay um okay. yeah and then like fiber as, as Susan said you you need to stiffen it somehow so um I might put another rod at the bottom to stiffen a runner mm -hmm. or the pieces behind me are all mounted so most of my work now is artwork on the wall mounted do you, do you teach do you I, I do I do. 
Um, okay. And I'm teaching, uh, I teach a lot of design basics. So okay. understanding the elements and principles of design rather than technique. You know, right. as far as I'm concerned, right. it's a five minute lesson and then a long journey. Right, right. Um, I think Susan for all Morgan. of us, it's, it's an artist journey, isn't it? Yes, all of it what is. we're doing. Yes, it is. Um, oh, shoot. What was I going to ask Susie Morgan? Rats, rats, rats. Well, okay. I'm, I'm going to take a break for a minute because I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Nancy, I'll, I'll help you in a totally different path. So you talk about the residencies. Do you do a series of that visit for that particular uh, park and then go on? Do you have like your, when you're home, do you have some favorite spots at home that you really like working on and, and showing us that environment too? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. We have a farm here mm. in uh, Pennsylvania. And so we have open fields. We don't farm it, you know, it's, but, um, but we have 40 acres of open fields. We have more than 60 acres of, of woods and creeks. So, um, so yeah, we have, if you love the country, we've, we've got it all right here. And it is just, it's just beautiful. And it's one of the reasons why we moved here. I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Um, and I lived in the Washington DC area for practically 30 years and then moved back home. And uh, so anyway, it's just beautiful. And um, yes, indeed, when I go to the national parks and two of the national parks that I've been to have been in Appalachia, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Holy moly, what a beautiful place. That is the place where I discovered water. Mm. And uh, that sounds stupid, but what I discovered was that it is possible to interpret it with fabric mm. and thread. Who knew? And uh, you can use, a you know, I like to use a little bit of inks and paints to help out what I do is fabric, it's a quilt. And uh, the inks and the paints just help out. But to answer, get back to your question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Great Smoky Mountains National Park inspired a series um, of seven mm. quilts that were water-based, water-based. They were, they were about the water. When you go there, Water is everywhere, and it follows you along the highway as you're as you're moving throughout the park. And there are places where it's waterfalls, it's cascades, and it's right there next to the next to the road. Shenandoah makes you work for it, mm -hmm. but it's there as well. And so both of these parks inspired uh, more than you know, a, a quite a quite a few water quilts my water dance series started at uh, the in the smokies and continued in shenandoah and i this one behind me this was inspired by shenandoah i just finished it so yes once i get home i have so many photographs yeah. that and so many so many things that i want to do uh so many pieces that i want to create uh, that yes, the national parks, once I return home, continue to inspire. There's nothing like it. If you ever feel the need to, uh, you know, get out there, um, there, the national parks website uh, is out there. And uh, all you have to do is search for artist in residence programs, national parks, or national park service. And there's a map showing you where all these residencies are. It doesn't take long to do the application. The application process is not that hard, but you do have to write um, essays. And, and uh, but there's nothing. And yes, if you want inspiration, it's, oh my, okay. 
can't say I could go on about the national parks and the inspiration <laughs> all day. And I'm going to, I'm not going to bore you with that, but yes, it's really, really awesome. Well, I think one thing that you convey in your description, certainly, but in your artwork, right in your artwork is almost being there and all the five senses that we, you experienced by being there. Um, just, just to see, I think fiber art, allows the viewer to become more, very familiar with it because we know cloth. And, and then people know that there's stitching and quilting or whatever. So they're really identifying it and they're looking at it. And I, I guess this is the time to certainly say to everyone, come visit the exhibit and, and look at all the work that's going on. I think there's 16 artists that are working in fiber besides all the other mediums. And the, Nancy, you were able to see this show. And as you were saying, to just really stand and look at some of these pieces and to understand and look um, more about process. I think that's really important. Susan, right. what do you think overall in your work, the viewer um, goes away from after looking at your work? Well, I'll speak to this particular piece. Um, I think, I, I hope that it does for the viewer what the subject matter did for me. Um, I feel this subject matter is, I, I took some risks in doing it, but when I started thinking about the portrayal of women in our modern culture, I started thinking about the portrayal of women by men when they're doing drag. And it opened up a whole can of worms for me. Um, I started just examining the images of what they were presenting, um, the words they used in speaking about themselves. And I hope that it does for the viewer that it just maybe makes them examine some of their own assumptions about the portrayal of women. Um, and I think in all my work, um, I'm presenting my own truth. Um, and my own truth is not always firm and black and white and cut in stone. Um, so even though my piece has a message i want um i want there to be dialogue and i'm not it's not black and white for me i i know there are grays and i hope that people when they're thinking about it see the gray areas and and i hope there's discussion in their lives after they've seen it like like after they've seen the whole show i think the thing that impressed me about this show um, is that the female narrative really in many of the pieces was really present. Mm -hmm. um, the female point of view, the inner, the, the looking at the internal um, female point of view. Um, I hope that the show helps people um, to see the female point of view um, that's that's certainly present in the show. Yeah, I found uh, a variety of pieces really are speaking, uh, as you said, from, from the mothering point of view, from being a individual. Um, being a daughter. Being a daughter, being um, in, in pieces, of, such as my other piece about the Supreme Court decision about abortion, um, just putting work out for conversation. I think that's, as you said, putting your work out and, and hoping that there is a conversation. And I think this particular exhibit opens that up for a lot of different pieces. Um, it, it, in the nature scenes, it 
the beauty that is there and for us to be able to recognize it and to protect it and be protective of it um, as much as more in your face pieces that we might be putting out that are, are, are difficult and maybe they're raw because of the particular time and, and you know, 20 years from now, there'll be documents and it, it will probably be better, but, but we, we're speaking now. I, I think that seeing the pieces in the show um, really helped me to look through the artist's eyes. I think that the pieces were, were very um, well done. I don't even know how to say it. Um, they allowed me to, to see another person's point of view. Um, whether it's looking at the beauty of nature like Nancy's and allowing me, I don't get out in nature that much anymore. I did a lot when I was younger. I don't do that so much anymore, but seeing Nancy's work through her eyes has brought up back a flood of memories for me. I remember when I used to take my shoes and socks off and go in that Creek and feel the water going over my toes. Um, there was another piece that I, I really did want to speak to Claire Ferris um, did the piece. I'm assuming it's about her mother's death. There were three pieces, I think. And it was so intimate. I could hardly bear it. And the intimacy that women in this show have shared is, is just amazing to me. It's very emotional. A lot of the work is very emotional. Yes, it was. So Susan, you, you've you not been out there yet? You've not seen it? Susan Beller? Okay. Okay, when were you no. there, Susan, Morgan? I, I have not been able to get there. Oh, okay. No, okay. I just, um, I went onto the Dairy Barn um, YouTube where they okay. show piece by piece um I, i'm not it's too far away for me to get there i'm not going to be able to fit it in my schedule sure i was really disappointed well op the opening was um in january mm -hmm. and it's ohio in the winter and uh but a friend of mine drove up here from the dc area and she she and i drove out there and uh, so it was, uh, you know, it's the Northeast or, you know, not quite the Midwest in the winter. And so, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was interesting, but we made it just fine. And then we get there. Now I had heard about the dairy barn. Uh, the dairy barn is you know, it is the be all and the end all. It's where Quilt National happens, you know? It is, yeah, it's got, yeah. And so I was pleasantly surprised to see that it really was a real barn that they converted, first of all. <laughs> that was impressive. Uh, but at the area where they have the show is on the first floor, which now I grew up on a dairy farm in a, you know, milking cows in a dairy barn. So that would have been the stable. That's where they would have milked the cows. And that's where they have all this art about the area that we're in. And so for me, being country girl at heart and a country girl, anyway, the levels of um, uh, not... It, there was there was a lot of inspiration there too when I saw work that is so not like what I do and uh, you know there it was such a diverse such a rich uh, exhibit I was just blown away and uh, they had performance art there too that was amazing that that picnic, right? Where yes, where the family was all dressed up in the gingham outfits. I love yes. that. And then you see it on the YouTube, and it's static. 
but yes, you, but, but by seeing it, you can't imagine it, uh, you know, the little family that, that performed for the opening being there or, or as Susan said, you know, going through the, through the water, I can imagine having a picnic, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, what was, it was really cool to see the little kids who were part of it and they, it's all, they, they knew what they were doing and they were, they weren't trying to get up and run around. They were staying in that space and they, it was, it was fascinating to watch because we could walk right up to that tablecloth and and watch them <laughs> it was so cool it was so cool i've never seen that before so uh yeah this was a really really impressive show well, i'm so great. glad that some one of the three of us actually is able to talk about the impression of the show uh it, it's exciting um uh, yeah it's a it's a it's a really cool space it's I, I just loved it. And it's, it's all painted white, but once again, relating to what I grew up with, you whitewash the barn right. on that floor. Everything's got to be clean. Everything's got to be, well, it doesn't have to be white, but my dad would have it whitewashed every couple of years. And so, uh, you know, that was all very familiar. And uh, what was really nice was that it didn't smell like a barn. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah and then on the second floor they have classroom space and that was you know that's pretty cool so so anyway yeah it was it's it's an experience if you get a chance to go see it just whatever exhibit they have there do it it's it's really beautiful space i loved it i have a question related to um your process, if we can go back to that for a minute, is it, um, what is the time of day that you work when you're most productive? Is it during the, in the morning? Is it in the afternoon? Is it the evening? Is it in the wee hours? What's your, Susan Feller, what's your, what's your time of day? It's sporadic, um, okay. but but if I have a topic, it's endless. Um, you know, put on a really good book on tape and not too far away, so you don't have to keep changing the discs. Um, maybe get up and get a cup of coffee and do a couple other things. But I I really buckle down on work and I like to start and keep going, so I'm able to do that. But my like Susan said there's one piece that I'm working on and I'm work on it. So in the winter, I bring that project up in the kitchen where the wood stove is and everything's there and I need to just tuck it away somewhere. And that's the nice part about rug hooking, it is portable. So I can just, you know, bring what I need and do that. But in the summertime, I'm downstairs. Uh, it's a beautiful Southern uh, view. So the, the doors open and, and I do right, live in the woods also. So it's pretty comfortable. So any time of day. How about you, Nancy? Me? You want to know something? Secret squirrel. The wee hours of the mm. night. I go to bed kind of early. I don't know why, but uh, probably because I'm up in the wee hours. Um, but I just wake up usually around 2 a.m. And now my studio is up here on the second floor. So I come up here. And, um, and I'll work and I, yeah, I plug in something that I don't really have to listen to, you know, but, um, yeah, that's especially when I'm fusing, when I'm quilting, it's different. I have to be a little more careful because, you know, the noise and all that, but, but if I'm fusing, I can go to town and I'll just, I'll stay at it until all of a sudden you realize it's 10 o'clock in the morning and I've, I've been doing this for eight hours already. Yeah. And, um, I got to get up and I mean, go downstairs and cook something. Um, so, so yeah, for me, it's, it really is the wee hours, but boy, like you said, 
once you get on a roll, it's hard to pull yourself away. Susan Morgan, are you the same way? Um, I'm an early bird, but I think the time of day that I work on my work depends on the task. Mm -hmm. um, I generally get up about five in the morning. And if I'm on, a, on, on the embroidery, I, do, I often do embroidery on my pieces. And I really do like when my husband's still asleep and it's just me and the radio and I can embroider. So embroidery, I'm most likely to do um, before breakfast. Um, the dyeing of the fabric is a middle of the day thing, as, as is the screening. That's all middle of the day. Um, once it gets to be getting late afternoon, I'm usually spent and can't move forward. The only other thing is, um, I don't work in sketchbooks. I don't, I don't, um, I don't keep a journal or work in sketchbooks. Once I get an idea in my head, I'm for the most part working out of my head. Um, mm -hmm. And when I think about that, I work out of my head, I'll do that anytime, day or night, when it, if I'm watching a movie with my husband and a boring part comes on, I'm immediately thinking, gee, should I make that drag queen's hair red or blonde? <laughs> um, and I'm thinking that my, my husband will be like, oh, what'd you think about that? And I'll say, oh, I missed it. What happened? <laughs> Or if I have to be a passenger in a car, or even if I'm driving a car, I will go over design choices in my head, and I will do that anytime, day or night. Mm -hmm. And if I'm especially excited about a piece, I have a hard time going to sleep. I'll lay in bed thinking about it until I fall asleep. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm, it depends on what I'm doing. Right. Right. So while you're working on the piece that you're on right now, are you also, are you, uh, do you do the work and perk? Is the next piece perking in your brain? Is the next one there? I, I that is extremely rare. Mm. I usually consciously, this may sound crazy. Maybe it's may it's just how my brain works. I consciously don't let myself think about a next project. Really? Every once in a while, I've got something in the back of my head, but I don't start working on it in my head or otherwise until the piece I'm working on is finished. Hmm. I'm really a one trick pony. Oh. I am focused on one piece sure. for however long it takes. Every once in a while, I abandon a piece. It's not working. It's not going to work for me. And I bundle it all up and I put it in the garbage can. My husband is horrified. My friends are horrified. But it's just a release. It's just, it didn't work. I couldn't do it. Stop now. Move on. And then, I'll, and then I start thinking about what the next piece might be and just repeat. Okay. Interesting. Susan Feller, do you have that, the next piece in your I head? I do when I've finally resolved all the problems of the piece I'm working on. Okay. So, for example, um, I, I usually draw out and then trace uh, using a light box onto my pattern, um, pretty much although it can be completely reversed and I just start with the raw canvas. So I have an idea of what's going on, but I, I just don't like to figure out the techniques and the materials until I get going. And that often is, is a stumbling block. The piece behind me was a digital drawing. And it, you know, just imagine all that texture that's going on there in a digital drawing, it's flat. And I really liked the drawing. And it took me six months to look at it and try and figure out, because I, I did want to do it in the techniques that <laughs> I'm noted for. Um, it took me six months to figure out the different techniques and the materials and how I was going to approach it. 
So it's the same drawing, but finally I figured it out. And when I did, it, it just flowed. And I was able to work on something else after that. But until then, it really does nag me. And like Susan said, I don't throw, I've archived my stuff enough that, you know, it's called not finished, but I will put something away. Su Susan, you, you cut out there for that last bit. And I'm, I wanted to hear what you were saying. Maybe you could repeat yourself. <laughs> um, you, you started off with like Susan and then you spoke. Like, like you, um, you throw your stuff away. I will put my work that I really can't process and figure out. I will roll it up and put it away. So I have a pile of a few <laughs> things that aren't done. Um, and I'm not going back to them. You're not going to go back to them? I, I, I know where the pile is. And if I really am in a rut and don't have something to do, I'll explore that pile. And I have finished something from that pile, but others, I just, they're not gonna do it. Or, or I don't have the time anymore to work on that particular topic. Let's just put it that way. You know, they, they were entertaining rather than important. Nancy, do you have several pieces going at the same time? I have one piece going in real life. One piece, you know, consecutive, but I've got a whole bunch perking in here. What's the next one? Which one is it gonna be? Which, you know, uh, which body of water or which mountain? Um, and I, uh, you know, I've, I think I mentioned I, did a few national parks. Um, so, you know, which park do I want to, do I want to revisit this beautiful, tranquil area at Stones River in Tennessee, middle Tennessee, flat, 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 flat. You don't have, you know, it's very different from the mountains and the sunsets and the waterfalls very different do I want to do something else so yeah there that's always going on maybe I'm a little bit you know uh I don't know there's a lot of synapses firing up here but uh uh but yes there, there's always the next one what's next and what's after that while I'm doing this one because when you're sitting down you're fusing and you've made a lot of significant design choices already that it's a matter of getting these up here then your brain my brain kind of wanders kind of no not kind of it wanders <laughs> so um so so anyway yeah yeah there's always that going on uh-oh hello Hi. i see popping <laughs> <laughs> back in yeah <laughs> oh well anyway so yeah there i'm done oh 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 if i can ask one more yeah, go ahead. <laughs> to both Susan and Susan, I finally remembered what I forgot earlier. And that was regarding your process. So um, are you are you drawing anything, not on paper, but on fabric or whatever, uh, to uh, to remind yourself where everything is going to be? Or is it done in a grid? Is that what's how do you how do you do it you don't just sit there and and start you know what i mean for for me i get the vision in my head and and like i said earlier i'm i'm thinking about it during my everyday life and i work on it work on it in my head and i get a, a picture a mental picture of it and then i take my images um the components of my piece and I print them on paper. Um, so for instance, in the drag queen piece, the little mask of the blackface man is an out of, out of copyright image. I printed that off my computer onto paper as I did with the drag queen. I printed it on paper and then, and I make it to real size and I make, and then I, tape it all down on paper as okay. a guideline for the real thing. And it's all true to size. 
so I'm working on these pieces of paper that are like this big. Wow. Wow. That's how I okay. manage it. Okay. And for mine, for the runners, I just each month nine -ish inches. So they're 54 inches long, six months at nine inches each month and tried to get it to flow with the background. Um, there's a visual image in the upper left and then one in the middle and then one on the right. And then again, so it's the diagonal visuals and then the words all over the place. I didn't really plan. I tried to use different fonts, whatever font was a, important, uh, a logo or something and changing it up. And that's how that particular piece happened. And the, most of the motifs were from a rug hooking pattern line that I had before that I had all the designs. So they were, I wanted them to be Appalachian. For, there's a log cabin and a tree and mountains and such. Um, and then in the um, Jane's Choice, that, that was literally drawn out first. Um, everything is symbolic. I, I placed it. I re rearranged the lettering completely. I made it look like a headstone and, and all is balanced that way. So most of the time, and that's usually on a grid um, piece of paper that I then go to the light box and transfer it onto my linen. I, I am the worst drawer in the world. In, <laughs> in school, the drawing class was so hard on me. I seem like I never got better. So I avoid drawing anything ever. <laughs> I don't draw either. I don't draw. No, I'm working off a grid. And so a grid keeps everything in proportion. So, um, and then so. All, all your different parts fill in, in that particular grid area and they keep uh, it. Yeah, for the most part, yes, unless I'm doing that, like behind me, the whole sky, that's all one piece mm -hmm. that was fused on there. And then, you know, uh, this one behind me actually is a lot of large pieces, uh, whereas the one that's at the dairy barn right now is a lot of teeny weeny little pieces. And that one, yeah, the grid really comes in handy because it's, you you know, I'm drawing the grid on the, on the uh, inspiration photo so I can see okay what's what's here what am I working on right here because you can get lost very easily mm -hmm. and then things get out of get distorted and out of whack so so I don't know it's just interesting because we're so um uh, we have like I said earlier we we're doing we're all working with fiber but we're doing we each have a different voice so so it was an absolute pleasure. And I'm sure Carrie Ann is here to say, okay, girls. Cut it off. <laughs> um, so no, I just Listen wanted to say <laughs> what an honor it was to be, uh, to be part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think this was been really a lot of fun being able to step into everybody's studio and hear our studio processes. Yeah. Um, I think that's part of women of Appalachia is telling our stories. It's, it's yes. really, really important. I agree. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you for joining me today. Um, and also like adding your thoughts on your pieces and the exhibition as a whole. Um, I personally find this exhibition really moving. Um, it is emotional, like Susan said. Every time I walk through it, I feel like I get goosebumps hearing the stories from the artists. Um, yeah, so it's great to hear feedback on it. Um, and if you're in the Athens area, make sure to stop in and check out the artwork um, below. I will link the Dairy Barn website as well as all three of the artists' websites so people will have access to those. And if you want to reach out and um, hear what the artists have to say or have any questions, you're welcome to do that. So thanks again for coming.